Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September 22nd, 2016 meeting of the School Board of the Dover Area School District. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Benko, could we have roll call, please? Mr. Rawhauser? Here. Mrs. Maley? Here. Mrs. Herman? Here. Mr. Emick? Here. Mr. Eifert? Here. Mr. DeLauder? Here. Mr. Deshaux? Here. Mr. Cook? Here. Mrs. Britton? Here. Everyone is present. Okay, thank you very much. First item on our agenda tonight are presentations from architectural firms. Uh, that are here to discuss the possible uh, renovation or building project for the district. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cherry and Mrs. Benko uh, for the period of time. Okay, everyone. Uh, we have five presentations tonight. Um, just to recap, uh, McKissick Associates will be first, and uh, Schrader Group, Crabtree Roar Bar, Roar Bar, sorry, RLPS, and then EI Associates. Um, they were just picked randomly um, out of a hat uh, by, by the um, administration here this evening. And each architectural firm will have 15 minutes to present their information to you. Um, this isn't, you know, a question answer kind of presentation. They are here to present, you know, their information and what their firm is. Um, and we will give them a two minute <coughs> warning um, during their pre presentation so they know that it's about that time to wrap up. That way we can keep things rolling today. Um, so are there any questions before we get started? The purpose, as I understand it then, is to look at the five firms tonight and their possible qualifications. Hopefully then narrow this down to have maybe two or three firms come back to do full presentations that might take an hour, hour and a half each with their complete capabilities. Is that the plan yes that is the, the plan okay so um, we have McKissick Associates um, please be patient um, while I switch between between presentations and tonight from McKissick we have Rich Karch, Karcher, Karcher. Karcher. Vern McKissick Michael Hall and John Snyder Um, I'm not a sitter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll just Just give me one minute on my is the remote for the okay, great. Hopefully. Okay, you may begin. Okay, um, thank you very much for your time and certainly for the opportunity to present to you. Uh, we are uh, McKissick Associates and in our uh, joint venture relationship with Fannie Howie Associates. Um, my call is joining us today. As we move forward, we're a Harrisburg firm, assuming that everybody works. Well, one quick question. I'm just wondering for those that might be viewing this online, should they microphone. be speaking into a microphone? <coughs> Yeah, can you um, speak into the microphone? Is this better? It is. All right, that's fine. Uh, my name is Rick Karcher. I'm with McKissick Associates. We're a Harrisburg firm. We're 24.1 miles away, so we like to view ourselves as being local service for you. Um, this is the, uh, the, the, the trio tonight that will be presented to you in addition to uh, John Snyder from our civil engineer who's extremely important on this process. 
As we move forward tonight, we'd like to let you know that the amount of work that we've done um, over our, our careers and certainly with Fanning Howie's is we've done about a billion and a half dollars throughout Pennsylvania, over 112 school districts. Vera and I have worked together for over 25 years. When you look at Fanning Howie's portfolio, in the past five years alone, they've designed 92 high schools, over $1.3 billion worth of value. It's considerable, and we're very proud to have them associated. Mike Hall is here because he, in our opinion, is one of the best uh, experts in K-12 through and high school design there is in the country. He'll be speaking at the CEFB conference coming up next week in Philadelphia. The most important thing on this, and we will leave this with you, is um, he's twice received the Shirley Cooper Award from AASA, which is a publication in our, in our um, profession that's very highly revered, and more importantly, 23 Impact Awards from American School and University. So what we're bringing is an outsider from Pennsylvania. It's a national expert. So we can bring other pertinent information and expertise from a lot of the schools this gentleman's done throughout the uh, country. I'm not going to go through the list, but this list shows you how he's written, how he's publicized, and how he's spoken at numerous conferences and throughout uh, various organizations and memberships throughout the country. So as we move forward, we're going to turn it over to Mike to talk now. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I am Michael Hall. I'm an architect, educational planner, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, so I have a, an interest in the future of education beyond our profession. I want my kids to be best educated that they can be. Uh, and as a planner that we work all over the country, we're seeing for 21st century design a convergence of four different items that are directing the design of new schools. Number one is a collaborative learning environment that is coming from the, the educational delivery folks, the teachers, the staff. We have certainly concerns about safety and security in school buildings. We're dealing with sustainability, lowered energy costs, and using the building as a teaching tool, and then integrating the technology into all that in a school building. So all that's converging in the design process. The question is how far do you want to go with that? Uh, these are some of the words that you might read out there, project-based learning, flexibility, blended learning. These are all different delivery models that are being used in 21st century schools. Again. How far do you want to go? Uh, I think you're already down this road of going one-to-one -one devices, but uh, kids are comfortable with these and know how to operate them much better than, me, than I do even. And your building needs to reflect that, and it needs to reflect spaces for kids to do that. Uh, in safety and security, we're using what's called a basic neighborhood in school design, where kids can shelter in place in case there's an event, uh, in small learning groups with a teacher, with restrooms, uh, with uh, two exits and one out the back so kids can leave the building if something's going on. This actually comes from our experience with the Department of Defense Educational Activity Schools that we're doing right now with them. So all this is critical to the design process. How do we get there? We use a charrette process. It's an in intense period, usually three days times two times or three times. Bring in the community, bring in your stakeholders, work very diligently on looking at images and other things that might be of interest to you, exteriors, interiors, colors, finishes. And so you help us design the building as we're moving forward. We also believe very strongly in developing a project website where all this information is, is put up for your community to get to if they can't make the meetings. In science, we're seeing what's called the next generation science labs where kids are moving into STEM and STEAM programs. That takes different equipment. This is a, the same STEM program, but again with another layout with, with some of the grids and things on the floors that relate back to the science and mathematics curriculum. Uh, what you and I knew as the library then became the media center. Today we're seeing it as the research commons. It's where kids go to research, to, to use their devices. I think if you stop and think about it, everything that you need to know in nonfiction is on the web. It's all there already. You can type in anything and find all the nonfiction. So what do we need those types of spaces for? Places for kids to go work and collaborate. In collaboration, this is a collaboration space in a middle school. You'll see the classrooms off of that space, kids in small <coughs> groups, movable furniture. That's all important. But again, how far does this district want to go? Uh, this is a new high school we're working on right now. It has a smaller collaboration space. But again, it's, it's, you'll see the house design, you'll see the neighborhood, you'll see the ability to lock it down, and still it's open and flexible for teachers and students. Uh, and this is our video, which I understand doesn't work, so uh, I'll turn this over to Vern to we'll talk. We'll leave a thumb drive with you that could be placed on the Mac machine if you wish to look at the video. 
Right. Vern's going to talk about plan kind. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. My uh, Vern McKissick, uh, educational planner, uh, son of a school superintendent and an art teacher, so I didn't fall very far from the tree. Uh, this is the pile of plan con forms on my desk this morning as we go through. Uh, we've completed over 75 plan con projects in Pennsylvania, and I'd like to say that I kind of invented it, uh, but I can only partially say I did the electronic version of plan con back in 93 because the state wouldn't let me use my spreadsheets if I didn't give it away. So we worked it out, and, and that is the genesis of all the forms that are used uh, to this point. Uh, we've been stayed very involved, worked with Seth Grove a great deal, much of the language in the ARCON, which was the revised plan con that unfortunately hasn't passed yet, we wrote working with him. And uh, even next week, I will be moderating the, uh, the day-long plan con school construction summit that's being held at the uh, state capitol. So we're very much in the center of things, very much in the know on plan con, and uh, uh, certainly are in a position to be able to pick up what's been done to date. Uh, one, one project that we went through plan con that's near here that we did mention in our RFP, you'll see in the, th in the booklet. Uh, I only focus on this, this was Big Spring High School. A couple of commonalities, this was a place where I built a new high school. Uh, we converted the high school to middle school. We went one step further, the middle school became an elementary. Uh, this one works actually very well. Although it's uh, 10 years old, you'll see a lot of the common design elements in terms of houses, subject area, uh, ganging zones uh, in, internal to the building. But most importantly, the capacity was 1,400 students with core facility for 1,800. And for us, with a swimming pool, uh, 800 seats in the auditorium as opposed to 1,200, but we were able to pull the building off for well under 220,000 square feet. Uh, and as looking at the plan con that's been approved, we see that as having an opportunity perhaps for diverting some resources in other directions. Uh, if we just run through with a slightly smaller footprint, which we're very, very, very comfortable with given, the, uh, given what we've seen in your, ed in your documents, that could be six and a half million dollars. And so that's one of the things that we're really devoted to, looking at state, national standards, and with the experience, what could work for you. Uh, coming closer to home, one of the things I wanted to do, and you'll see in our documents, uh, that we've included five uh, pretty good prototypes. And uh, we start with your site, of course. Uh, this happens to be the Big Spring building, if it were to be placed on your site. Looking at another one that you'll see in there, the uh, new Wellsboro High School that we did, uh, again, fits very well onto your site. And even uh, a building that's more one story, two stories, as opposed to going to multi-story, uh, the Wayne uh, prototype, which, uh, uh, which uh, Fanning Howie worked on, um, fits as well. So I guess we want to point out, we think there's alternatives in other directions uh, that can go and still work on the site as opposed to maybe a more traditional linear uh, configuration. One of the things that your RFP uh, indicated was a very aggressive schedule. And we wanted to talk about how that uh, might be accomplished. And Rick, you want to take that up? Certainly. Um, the key to this is if you look at, if you look at the uh, the dots on the left, we've sort of worked through a schedule where those dots represent either a Tuesday or a Thursday committee and or board meeting. But the key is we have to have decisions made fast. Uh, and also Vern showed some schools that could be site adapted to a site. And we're talking about gestation period of less than almost two years to get into a building that needs to be occupied. But the key here is to come to some conclusion where the, the board would adopt before Thanksgiving an Act 34 resolution, and you've done schools before so you know what the Act 34s are, with an Act 34 hearing right before Christmas, and then moving into December and into the first of the year, Vern, as we move forward through here, approving your plan con from the Act 34 in January, going through the working drawing phases so that by the time April rolls around, around Easter time, we have plan con Part G approved. We submit it to the Department of Education with the, hope, with the hope that upon the completion of school, we start groundbreaking for the start of your new high school. When you look through the schedule there for the next 14 months, we'll start constructing that high school. And then when the summer of, seven, of 19, geez, the summer of 2018 occurs, we'll start to demolish the junior, the intermediate school. So that by the time the school starts, we'll have the pavement in. Then subsequent to that, then and moving towards November of 2015, we'll do the grass, the, the planting, and all the fine trim and, and the tuning for that so that you can get into the school project for the start of school by the 28th of August, completed and punched this by December 15th. It is doable, it's aggressive, and what's gonna be more important than anything is this gentleman here. Um, we can move as fast as you, but there's gonna be a lot of land development, planning, erosion control, 
reviews, and this is the gentleman hopefully will work us through this. RGS is a local land planning, land development <coughs> firm. We are members of your community, offices in New York and Harrisburg. We've done many projects, Terra Vista, Lytle Grocery Store at the old Surefine. It's all beginning construction. We do this through collaboration with architects, with landscape architects, with engineers to come up with the best design solutions. We also have the ultra-modern technology with site ops program to evaluate sites very quickly to identify pitfalls. But the other important thing is our relationships. We have maintained very strong relationships with the township and the borough, DEP, with the conservation district to try to expedite your approvals. We also understand that these approvals are necessary and whatever we can do to help avoid additional approvals such as avoiding wetlands or floodplain impacts, avoid delays with NPDES permitting or PennDOT permitting, we do for you. Thank you. Not quite sure how where to place these in the presentation, but it was one of the items I do know you ask about, and that was bidding accuracy. Uh, one of the things that we do pride ourselves on, I believe this is the last 10 uh, projects that we did, um, well, the font changed a little bit, but you'll see that we've averaged about 1.55% under our estimates between PlanCon uh, Act 34 numbers and actual bid receipts, and a variety of renovations and new construction where renovations in, uh, can actually be more difficult. Uh, change order history was also something that you'd inquired about. Again, our history of change orders has been exemplary. We've averaged about 0.79% for uh, change orders resulting from uh, our projects. Those also include renovations. New construction numbers are, of course, much lower than this, but we wanted to take the last 10 projects so that we were giving you a fair, uh, fair comparison. You have approximately two minutes. Okay. My so, role. Rick, I'll leave. <coughs> so, what are our strengths? <coughs> so, what are our strengths? We believe we have one of the best in the country as far as a consultant on board yeah. with Fanning Howie. And it's, it's, a, it's an honor for us to, to attempt to team with them again. We've worked before, and we certainly look forward to working again. Yeah. Between Vern and myself, uh, Charles, who would be your project manager, two other gentlemen here, we have a century worth of work that we've done. Well, this is what we live for. We're still married. <laughs> we still have kids. First and uh, uh, in spite of all the late hours, this is what we live for each night. And uh, uh, that's what our life has been dedicated to. So you, you, you get commitment when you get us. Our consultants are an engineer we've worked with for 30 years on over $600 million worth of work. A structural engineer, we've probably done a quarter of a billion dollars worth of work. Excellent food service. Who's not listed on here is my uh, a very, very good friend, a, a, a woman architect from Pittsburgh, who I think is probably one of the best on the East Coast to work with sustainability on sites and landscape architecture. She's just stellar. Um, we're committed to design and lead and, and sustainability in and, 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 and tangent with our civil engineer, our landscape architect, Sarah Moore, and our design team. We'll give you what you need. Um, we are also concerned about uh, SEPTID and, and security, as Mike had talked about briefly in, in the first slide here. And as we move forward here, uh, we believe in, in, in having experience with traditional, traditional department approaches to some of our designs. We have the interdisciplinary instructional program ability of creating things for you and certainly the flexibility. And the slide that didn't work would have shown that flexibility in the layout. Yes, so when you much. go on the video, you'll see the flexibility because the selection of the materials, the finishes, and the equipment and furniture is even as vital as the design itself. We're all part of all the national organizations you would need. And again, CEFBE conference, everybody following us today is a part of CEFBE, but this gentleman and, this, and my colleague here are premier and eminent in the CEFBE organization, I, will, I, I can say that. Cost-effective design, plan con reimbursement. There's no guarantee of what you'll get re for reimbursement, but we'll maximize it for you. There's no question about that. And Your we will fight is. for you. And oh. we have gotten interest-free loans for uh, William, or Williamsport Area School District for $72 million with no interest through the Koozie Bonds. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Did much you design. have you, um, copies of your thing um, for everyone. We have the 15 copies of the, yeah. of the proposal that we were asked to leave. Okay. And then we have an additional supplemental information, and we'll leave the thumb drive for you if you want to see the animation. Okay, so, great. Thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Chicken pot pies at the 72 Highway restaurant over there. Don't worry, man. Until next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you.
Up next, we will have the Schrader group. Somebody left their folder. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh. They'll be back. Yes. <laughs> They'll be back. Okay. Uh, two of you can sit at the table. The rest will have to gather around. Uh, you will need to use the microphone. And just make sure you record it. So we Our second group tonight is Schrader Group Architecture. We have David Schrader, Harry Petoni, Tom Forsberg, Courtney Onsbach. Mike Rader and Mark Kurowski. So you have. Uh, if you could just give me a minute, please, to, get, to we'll, we'll set up. <laughs> Am I on or? Yeah. I am. Okay, great. Go ahead, continue. Does it matter where I'm pointing to or? Uh, there, there you go. go. Okay, great. Is it working now? I, yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Super. Well, thank you. Um, we'll jump in. Um, so, you know, we, we formatted our presentation um, to follow the information that was given to us and highlighted six bullet points um, in that order. So I don't know if you're scoring or um, whatever, but that's how we structured the presentation overall. Um, give you a little bit of background of... Sorry. Hey, yeah, it Go is ahead. working. Um, <laughs> A little bit of background of um, Schrader Group and, and our team. Um, as prime architect, Schrader Group architecture, we also have in-house structural engineering, so we would be servicing the project from a structural standpoint um, in-house. Uh, K&W Engineering um, is part of our team, or civil engineering, Barton Associates for mechanical electric plumbing, um, ICI for cost estimating, um, and then we have uh, two other specialty consultants with us, um, K McFarland Kistler for food service and also M Metropolitan Acoustics. Um, a little overview about Schrader Group Architects. Um, we've been around as standalone Schrader Group since 2004. Um, we're one of the fastest growing education firms um, nationally. Um, we're, we've been uh, moving up the, the ladder very quickly um, and just this year ranked uh, 76 um, and that's a, a, a primary portion of our business is um, education planning and education facilities throughout the mid-Atlantic. Um, David and I have uh, pretty much focused our careers uh, over the last 25 years in education. Quick. Uh uh, good evening, folks. My name is Mark Kurowski. I'm a civil engineer, uh, licensed PE in the state of Pennsylvania, co-owner of KW. We are site designers, civil engineers, and landscape architects. Uh, educational facilities are one of our specialties. We've done over 100 facilities uh, over the past 11 years. Personally, I've been doing educational work for over 20. I would note also our scope is generally everything outside the building. So we're responsible for site design, traffic, stormwater, et cetera. And we are very familiar with Dover Township. Actually, right now we have a project coming out of the ground for Lighthouse Baptist Church. Uh, so we certainly know the area, and we've done a number of projects in the past for the district as well. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike Rader. I'm a principal with Barton Associates. We're a mechanical electrical engineering firm located literally eight miles away from the district. We've uh, been in business going on our 50th year. We've completed more than 1,500 K through 12 projects in over 100 school districts uh, across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, on a personal note, I uh, live literally 10 minutes away and uh, we practice on the fields here at Ketterman Park for uh, lacrosse. I'll be there Saturday and Sunday, so thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, a little bit more on uh, Schrader Group. From the standpoint of education, um, and when we talk about awards, our awards are um, education-based. Um, our primary focus has been um, state-of-the-art, 21st century learning environments, 
Um, and one of the things that we glean, um, we glean this globally. Um, David Schrader, myself, we're uh, very active in various education organizations. A for LE, one of them. And David's one of um, the chairman coming in um, over the next year. And we've had the opportunity to travel throughout the world and really see what's being exemplified, what's being built, what works and what doesn't um, on a very grand scale that we're able to bring to each one of our clients um, on a very individual basis. Um, all our projects are sustainable. Um, it's pretty much common practice. Whether you're looking at LEED or not is really um, uh, you know, up to you in terms of certification, but we Im implement um, every one of those concepts from the beginning to end. From a B PDE standpoint, a majority of our work um, is in Pennsylvania. Um, we're very active. We, we have uh, 42 current projects um, with uh, PDE and pretty much on a consistent daily basis interact with Jim Vogel um, at the state. As I said, we cover um, throughout the, the region as far west as uh, State College and also fall within your boundaries as local. Um, we are one of our offices, Tom and I are um, in Lancaster, we're, we're within that 40 mile radius. Okay, hi. Hopefully we'll warm it up a little. Um, David Schrader and uh, we are want to talk first about the the study portion because it seems like what you're trying to do we would call it a part a services and the part a is trying to get you enough information about what it is you want to do so you can make some good decisions so these are just a variety of the districts that we've worked with in the same capacity working through those kinds of projects we have an interesting project going on right now this I'm, I'm going to show you a couple uh, this is in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, so forgive the southeastern portion of the, the project, but it's the same exact thing that you're trying to do. We're going to build a new building on an existing building site. We have to figure out how to phase it around the same kind of situations that you're trying to phase it around. And so we'll go through a programming process that will be as in-depth as this. And we're doing this one as a joint venture uh, with a good friend of mine, Steve Turks. But uh, ultimately, we've got this whole project going in the same way that you guys are looking to do it. And there are a couple highlights here, one of which is trying to reduce the overall square footage by trying to find as many combined spaces as we can get for you. Um, say, at the same time, when you reduce the square footage per student, you're also reducing the cost of the building. So those are some of the factors that we'll try to go through as we try to lead you through the process. That building. It's an interesting building. It's on a tight site. Again, to me, there's a lot of similarity between what we're doing in this Delaware County project and what it is you folks are trying to do. Uh, in order to try to get as much athletic field on the site and leave as much greenery as possible on the site, we actually had to make a very compact footprint. So what you're seeing is a facility that's structured with an athletics area on the north side of this, of this drawing, a performing arts closer to almost the townscape portion, and then the core portion happens to be all of the academic areas. Lots of shared spaces within that. On the ground floor, we've tried to find a way to, to multi-use, for instance, the auditorium by making the auditorium a 400-seater, having a black box behind it that has another 200 to make a grand total of 600 seats in the auditorium. But it's two different spaces that can be used separately at any time. That same thinking goes throughout the whole project, so it's got a lot of very unique parts to it. And it is a three-story building, and the goal here is our STEM areas on the third floor. They're looking at an, a career academy model. They're going to slowly step into that by creating STEM on the top floor, maybe a liberal arts program on the middle floor, and then on the lower floor, they'll do a lot of their arts and humanities portions as well. So it's a, it's a very interesting project. It's underway as we speak. Um, we will knit and tailor the design of a building specifically to you and your context. This facilities committee on this project happens to be made up of a bunch of architects. And so they said, make it a very contemporary building. We will blend to whatever it is that you folks are looking to do architecturally. But you can already see by the layout of that facility, it's a very compact footprint. It has all those components we talked about. The stadium is actually canted in order to allow us to get five full playing fields on that site. So you look at a site and you think about it very creatively and you come up with something like this. Uh, you can start to see how the building itself feeds into the stadium and helps to support that. This was the part one process. So we got to the point where we're actually doing all the budget estimating for it right now. 
However, we went through a whole series of schemes on that site to get them to the point where this made the most sense, and I'll show you how we did that in a second. Uh, it, through another project. This just gives you the idea of how some of the structures set up. Multi-use, outdoor use spaces, lots of uh, areas for outdoor learning as well. And then shared spaces, the one on the right, another example like the auditorium happens to be, they know they need dining, they know they need a media center, they know that Starbucks and uh, Borders are where the kids like to go, and so they said let's make a commons instead. So that whole structure happens to be, let's see if I can get it to go to it, that's the commons. It's a great learning area, it's a great dining area, it's a great, uh, great space for people to just be and to do the research that they need to do. And just the front area where we're, we're combining the black box and the auditorium. So there are a variety of pieces that we're trying to do for parent drop-off and bus drop-off and the parent drop-off, which is becoming so critical to all of your buildings today. And then concourses <laughs> between the, the, the areas of the athletics and the building. So, so that's that's a project where we're doing, we've gotten them to the point where they now know what the budget is and they're ready to go forth because they picked through a series of processes. I have to bring up a project that we did both eight and ten years ago, which is your neighboring district. Uh, I did all the planning and design for the original building and then three years later came back and did the additions to it to expand it, as well as the, uh, the natatorium structures and all the other structures under the stadium. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, we actually took all of our projects from the last five years and averaged their cost per square foot. Now realize we're dealing everywhere from State College to this region to southeastern Pennsylvania. So our numbers are probably a little bit higher because we actually have a Philly school in there. We have some in Delaware County as well. So it is $197 a square foot over the last five years with average change orders of 1.6%. I know that was one of the questions that was asked. Central, what we did was we extrapolated. I think it's a very good thing to take a look at the cost of that building per square foot when we built it. It was built at $164 a square foot, including site. If you take and you do a 3% extrapolation per year to 2016, it's a $220 a square foot project with site. 135 acres of site work, so there's probably $20 to $25 worth of site work in that. So that building was about $195 to $200 in today's dollars. So if you're looking at what that would cost you to put it in your district, that's approximately what it would be. Um, you probably all know the facility. Um, it is a local district to you. All of the site design was critical to us. But the thinking at that point, and this was with Glenn Kaufman and Dr. Restep, uh, that was built around the academy model. Ryan Kaufman now, as you know, is running the building and he uh, is following in, in his father's footsteps in the running of the building as an academy structure. So it's got a lot of large group learning areas with the other uh, classroom spaces gathered around the perimeter of that. The, it's funny because the four academies that are built into it, the one that uses those common spaces the most is the Arts Academy. So you probably have gone in there and seen all the sculpture in that facility uh, that happens to be in that space that's shown as empty right now. And just some of the spaces in there. Obviously, academics on one side, athletics on another, and then performing arts on the front side of the building. Another example is a Philadelphia school. This is the George Washington Carver High School, and this was the uh, School of Science and Technology. Um, and I'm just gonna buzz through here because I see that my time frame is running down. But again, student spaces, spaces for the students to work rather than lots and lots of instructional space. And what those allow you in the future is those spaces allow you the area to expand short term should you have bubbles of students because we can allow those spaces to become classroom spaces in the short term in the interim. But lots of lab type spaces and so on. So how do we do that with you? The question was construction philosophy, but it looked like it was marrying educational philosophy to, uh, to how you put a building together. And so we know that students learn differently. We know that they learn using different types of spaces. We all work in different spaces than we used to. And so we try to focus on the teaching and learning trends and how they relate to the facility trends. And we'll leave that information with you to kind of cogitate over. Um, on your project, for instance, we would see two groups of teams. One is a planning team responsible for the day-to-day. -day. The other is a workshop committee, which is the group here all responsible for high-end work. And we go through that process like this. This happens to be Upper Marion and Montgomery uh, County, Pennsylvania. And you end up with 5,200 people in a workshop format made up of school board administration, building administration, students, and community. And none of those people standing over those drawings are architects. Those are people sketching for what they want for their community. You and have you just, two minutes. Thank you. 
uh, turning that into programs so that they get to work through the process, site plans so that they get to design what works in their site, and then it's our job to take that and make that into some kind of diagram. That turns into a floor plan. That becomes the structure around that educational process that you, the district, want to do and the community wants to do, and ultimately site plan and onto a project. So that's the workshop process that we will end up using. So to close, um, why Schrader Group? Um, yeah, you have, we know we have our competition, but Schrader Group has a lot of experience. We bring um, an, an exorbitant amount of 21st century learning environment experience to you, as I mentioned globally. As I mentioned, and David talked about, in your neighboring district, projects that have worked, projects that you've experienced. Um, in addition to that, we've come in a, coming off of large projects. Um, we just completed um, simultaneously three elementary schools. It was a little over $100 million um, worth of projects. So we have the capacity um, to deliver. Uh, one thing that we, we didn't mention that's very unique, you see us. Um, as principals, we're involved day to day in our projects. David is um, heavily involved in every workshop and putting those workshops together, bringing all that material together. So um, we have a tiered structure of project managers, but you're also getting a principal level um, attention at each project. Um, from the standpoint of promise, um, you know, we're, we're dependable. We, we work with you, we listen to you as a community and a partner in your community. Can I finish? Your time is up. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll respect that time. I <laughs> can't now. I can't the rest of the slide and your time is up. So thank you for having us this evening. We truly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up will be Crabtree Roarball. Tracy Roarball, Scott Cousin, and Leah Schilling. She will start the presentation when she's not up and up. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, you may begin. First of all, I want to thank the Dover Area School District for the opportunity to present uh, Crabtree Warbon Associates credentials to you this evening for your high school project. Could you speak into the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, together, we've done a lot of work with your administrative team to get to the point of planning for this project. Um, tonight, we're going to follow the criteria that you sent to us, Mr. Nelson sent to us, um, to to go over in our presentation and you can also follow along in the booklet that we've passed out. Crabtree Roarball was founded in 1984 and we strive to provide a client-oriented approach to our architectural projects. We have over 70 individuals in our Mechanicsburg office which is located just over 15 miles from here. We have had a lot of recent recognition on architectural, our architectural designs as well as our company culture. And what makes that in, 
uh, important to you is even though our a lot of our client base is in educational projects we have a, a, a big client base in projects in the corporate um, arena as well as in high tech in healthcare providers as well as local government and we will be bringing all of that diverse <coughs> experience to your high school project just Another introduction of our team and our responsibilities. I'm Doug Rohrbaugh, I'm a founding partner of Crabtree Rohrbaugh, and I'm the principal that's responsible for educational architecture. My name is John Badia, also with Crabtree Rohrbaugh. I am the principal in charge. I will be responsible for project oversight from inception of the idea through completion of construction. And I am Tracy Rohrbaugh. I'm a principal of the firm and also the director of interior design. So my role for the project will be responsibility for the educational interiors. And I'm Scott Cousin. I'm a senior project manager and project architect for Crabtree Robot Associates. Um, focused mainly on educational architecture. And throughout my career with Crabtree Robot, I'm responsible and led over a uh, quarter billion dollars in high school projects. I'm Ken Kaufman, uh, president of Moore Engineering Company, and I'm a mechanical engineer. And my office will be involved in the MEP engineering. And my name is Leah Shiley. I'm the Director of Client Relations, and my role would be in community engagement and looking for any grant opportunities that we could uh, put towards the project. In addition to the staff that's here this evening, we have a group of people we've identified in our office that would be dedicated solely to your high school project. We've also identified a group of engineers, and we have worked. Can you sit and talk, please, into the, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> We have worked with this group of engineers on over 25 uh, other educational projects. So the project team that we're going to dedicate to your project has worked on every high school project in our office since 1984, 1994. So experience. Um, this list outlines our educational experience in higher, um, in the secondary, uh, educational market. Those that highlighted in red are clients that we have that we're currently working for in IU 12. So a lot of the other school districts around York County. In the last five years, this uh, graph outlines the high school experience that we have. Tonight, no other architectural firm that you are going to be hearing from has designed, bid, and dedicated a new high school. Crabtree Rohrball has done five. What, diving a little bit deeper into that, in the last five years, we've designed 2.3 million square feet of high school space. In the last 15 years, we've designed 7.2 million square feet of high school uh, classroom space. Out of that last five years, we've obtained $8 million in grants for those clients. Over 50% of those projects are seeking a LEED certification, most of them at the gold level. And most importantly, what that's done is improved educational spaces for over 17,000 students just in the local area. And I'm going to take an opportunity to touch on some of our recent high school relevant experience, starting with Spring Grove Area High School, which is located in York County. Um, I was project manager for Spring Grove and LEED designer. It was um, sized for 1,400 students, $44 million construction cost, which equated to about $133 a square foot. Um, it was designed around an academy model, and that meant um, we developed learning communities upon which uh, career pathways were developed for the students. That was the main organization of the building. Um, moving on, this is State College Area High School. This project is currently under construction. This is a $129 million high school in State College that was sized for 2,400 students. It comprises approximately half a million square feet of additions and renovations. And this is one of only two successful referendum projects in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, one of our most recently completed projects, this is uh, complete uh, not just three weeks ago it opened, um, so timing couldn't be more perfect. Uh, if we're selected, of course, I'll be able to focus mainly on your project. Um, this project was $160 a square foot. This is Middletown Area High School. It was for 800 students. Um, on this project, 
You'll see uh, later on in the presentation how we've implemented some of the 21st century learning environments that, that we focus on. And uh, one of the key aspects of this project was we were able to bring it in under 1% change orders uh, for final construction. And over half of them dealt with unforeseen site conditions. So the owner couldn't be more happy for what they got um, for the dollars they spent on this project. I'm um, not going to dive too much into the rest of these projects. Uh, in the interest of time, there is these are available in our proposal if you want to have more information. The first one we uh, went by was Midwest, which was completed in 2012. Cottage Area School District, which completed in 2014. This is Lewisburg Area High School, which is currently under construction. It'll, it's slated to be completed in November. And then Lastly, Montoursville Area School District, which is under construction, that's slated to be completed uh, the, the end of next summer. Uh, also not pictured here is Penn Manor Area School, Penn Manor School High School, which is uh, currently in the design phase, and Danville Area High School, which is also in the design phase. So we have a, a, um, a plethora of, of high schools currently in our portfolio. So, so cost is an important factor. We ended with this quote from Superintendent at State College. What does that mean to you as board members? Uh, it translates to square footage. So look very closely. The, the quality of the projects that we're showing you have been able to meet and exceed the school district's program. You get one shot to build a project like this. So cost-effective design solution is, is very important. So our philosophy in planning uh, and construction will be to assist the district and the board with developing a, a list of guiding principles. The purpose of this effort is to really take the time, the necessary planning steps uh, to take you through a discovery process, listening and finding out what is unique about the district, going through a visioning process where the guiding principles establish, the board tells us this is the most important thing about this project. And we as designers listen to it, it guides our direction, it gives us focus. All of these steps happen before you even begin the design phase of a project. Tools that we can bring to the table to help uh, with the decision-making process. This is from State College. There were a little over half a dozen building options that the board uh, contemplated, and we developed this matrix to assist in the decision-making process, making sure everything was an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. The board uh, determined what the criteria would be for the review process, and what this does is it really provides, again, guidance to the design team, uh, issues that have cost impact, but it establishes direction. It helps you establish direction and focus for the direction you wish to go. The design process itself, what this graphic is about, is keeping you uh, as a district at the center of our focus. Um, our goal is to implement a strategic plan that keeps your goals and your focus and your vision at the center of everything that we do from design through construction. This was an example of uh, process schedule. Uh, it could be also a construction schedule, <coughs> but it illustrates information to share with the public, the community, and all the stakeholders, all of the simultaneous tasks that have to occur uh, in order to move the schedule progressively. It also gives the board direction as to what is next, what important decisions have to be made in the schedule so the sequence of the project is adhered to and maintained. This helps keep the big picture and focus of the overall project and communicates to the public. At the very bottom of that schedule, you'll see the series of information going to the board, then to the community as a community engagement piece. Scott mentioned this earlier again. We'd urge you to contact our clients. We're very proud of our community involvement at State College. It was the second only passed referendum in the state of Pennsylvania with a 74% voter approval. When we talk about incorporating 21st century design into your spaces, there's key elements that we look at. You have to have small learning communities, and they have to be flexible environments. You have to make sure that you're grouping the areas by the learning styles and opportunities for the students. They have to have sustainable design, natural daylighting, appropriate acoustics in this space, and they must incorporate technology. By providing the appropriate furniture with their right connections, it really allows the teacher and the students to use every space as an educational tool, not just the classrooms, the commons. You need flexible breakout areas. And the image that's shown here is one just from Middletown High School. We'd encourage you to go see how these newly designed spaces are being adapted to by the teachers and by uh, the students as well. 
through innovative planning, we create flexibility over time. So we want to look at your spaces and I'll make sure that for the next, you know, next generations and as you're changing those teaching styles, you can move the furniture, movable walls to allow for an evolution of, of your spaces. You're seeing um, creating pods and nooks for the students. And we're not just talking about um, doing 21st century design, we're doing it. We're leaders in the field, we have speaking engagements at A4LE, and we also were asked for the second time um, this year to be part of PSBA's Classroom in the Future. We're very excited at this fall show that we will be having um, Lego and Apple as a part of the Classroom in the Future, which demonstrates different learning types and areas. Our plan con and funding experience is uh, extensive. Um, what we would bring to the table is a, a process by which to take you through the plan con process, which we've already established. Uh, we recently were invited um, and actually participated with Mr. Cherry at the plan con reform process as we were selected as one of the architects to help give the legislature some uh, insight to what is wrong with plan con and what could be done to improve it. Um, the vast majority, nearly 98% uh, of our projects pursue reimbursement, which we secure. And our firm also was selected by the Department of Education for two design clearinghouse schools uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we just wanted to briefly re uh, talk about the options that we developed for the purpose. We were proactive of meeting your, the moratorium deadline. We've developed these options to comply with uh, the submission of your plan con date, and that was, of course, a, a three-week start to finish date that the legislators set forth that we were able to fortunately submit your plan con part A document. And that in turn um, would result in our estimate of about $4.4 .4 million of reimbursement, which we've shared with the board. Um, and, and a lead silver certification pursuit would be an additional 10% um, funding revenue that could be available. This is the grant experience, the alternative clean energy grant that we have secured uh, nearly $14 million total for all of our school clients. Uh, and this was something that we would bring to the table and we've had a lot of success. You have just under two minutes. Good, because we're gonna do our closing. <laughs> uh, why Crabtree Rohrbaugh? I think first of all, our office location, uh, as Leah mentioned, we're within 15 miles of, the school dis of, of your school district. But on top of that, no one on our proposed team at Crabtree Rohrbaugh lives more than 30 minutes from your school district. So we're gonna be accessible to you. Uh, this team has designed over seven million square feet of high school space just in the last five years. I, I don't think you're gonna find another architect in Pennsylvania who's that type of high school experience. Uh, one of the things our clients get from us is a very cost-effective solution. We will be the only architect you will interview who will guarantee the construction costs. Once this board has set a budget for the project, we guarantee to you that we will meet that budget. It's something that we have guaranteed all of our educational clients, and we have fulfilled that guarantee on every project uh, since 1994 when we first began doing higher or doing educational projects. In uh, addition to that, it's the experience of our staff. This, this group has been together through all these high school projects. Uh, that experience stays with, with the firm and with the individual. In fact, uh, more than two-thirds of the projects that we showed you, uh, the project manager, the lead designer, uh, was Scott Cousins. I, I spent 17 years on the school board. I understand the importance of this project. I understand the importance of keeping the board and the public informed, and that's what you will get from us at Crabtree Rohrball. No surprises. Your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is RLPS. Okay. 
you can sit at the table. You will have to use the mic to talk because we're trying to record it. That's the only way to record it. Uh, our, our fourth group tonight is RLPS Architects, and we have Chris Linky, Brent Stebbins, Aaron Hoffman, Ken Kaufman, Jim California, and Mark Karowski. Good evening. You can start then. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Chris Linke. I am with RLPS Architects. Uh, been an interesting start to the evening. We like your process of putting all the architects in one room before we can. <laughs> <laughs> we all like stand up against the wall like we're on the old road over at uh, Hershey Park. So. <laughs> After 45 minutes, we've warmed up to each other. So. <laughs> um, I, we want all the team members to introduce themselves. So again, my name is Chris Linke. I'm with RLPS Architects. I'm a partner with RLPS. I'm Aaron Hoffman. I'm a project manager with RLPS. Uh, my name is Brent Stebbins. I'm a senior designer with RLPS. Uh, as you may be aware, I'm Mark Karowski with <laughs> K&W, site civil engineering and uh, site design, landscape architecture. Hello again, Ken Kaufman, Moore Engineering Company, MEP Engineering. I'm Jim California. I'm a structural engineer with Providence Engineering. So the people that you see here, this is our team, the team that you would see through the process. Um, Ken Kaufman and Moore Engineering, we've been working with them for over 30 years. Uh, Providence Engineering, uh, Jim California, we've been working with them for over 10 years. And we just want to talk about K&W. We have not worked with them before, but we understand the importance of having a local civil engineer that understands the local municipality and the school district. Every municipality and their regulations are different. Even though they try to be similar, they're all different and they'll have their nuances. So being, having K&W as part of our team to know the municipality and to know you guys is an important factor. I want to tell you a little bit about RLPS Architects. Um, you can see the information that we have up there. Uh, we've been, been in business for a long time. We have over 75 employees. The average tenure of our employees is over 10 years. And uh, recently, that's actually come down a little bit. We've had uh, a number of people retire uh, over the past five years. But we've had this opportunity to bring what we call in the office, the millennials into the office. So bringing them into the office has given us a balance across our age group from beginning to end and made us more vibrant in those, uh, in those changes. Uh, a couple other things with the size of our firm, um, uh, we're able to dedicate a number of people to be specialists for code reviews, constructability reviews, quality assurance. So. Um, we're not all generalists. We have specialists that can come in steps along the way. Um, and in addition to that, um, we have other markets that we work in. We work in higher ed, uh, senior living, and commercial work. So uh, we draw on all those experiences to make your project better. Um, but what we get out of that mostly is uh, de defining and refining our process, our process of listening to um, an owner, no, no matter what type of project it is, and the art of listening and getting you what you want is important to us. Um, some of the school districts that we've worked with are listed there, similar projects to what you're looking at. Um, and many of those projects shown up there, we've worked with more engineering, Providence engineering with, uh, to complete those. We're actually working right now with West Shore School District, one of your neighboring school districts on a district-wide feasibility study, and we're enjoying that process, getting to know them as well. Uh, but these, these school districts shown here are similar to what you're looking at doing. Um, some of the information that you wanted to uh, hear from us, um, we want to explain some of the, the breakdowns on here. Um, information that you had asked for is um, average cost per square foot. So we, we have two projects up here where we're showing project that uh, new construction cost per square foot was $182 a square foot, which doesn't include site. 
and we have one that's $130 per square foot without site. What we're trying to uh, express with this is we customize to what the school district wants. Some school districts, the price is the bottom line. Some school districts, longevity, et cetera, is the bottom line. So we'll work across the board to get you what you want. Uh, the change orders that we have up there, those are change orders not through the construction process. They don't include changes from the owner. They include changes through the process. And, and then the budget and the actual number. That budget number is the number that we had when we came out of plan kind B. So at the beginning of the schematic design process. The actual number was the number we received on bid day. So those two numbers aren't what we had estimated for the bid and what it came in. It was um, showing what happened along the way. Um, whether the school district realized they had more needs along the way or they were um, exposed to more opportunities and discovered that as we went along. So you'll have um, something relatively small on the first one uh, and then on the second one it was greater as the school district um, understood its needs a little bit more. Um, on this slide, um, again, we have Anvil Cleona School District and information on those, but we really wanted to talk about new construction and some averages. So across the, the past 10 years, our average cost per square foot is $150 per square foot. Um, but we also, we throw a different measurement in for our office. Uh, we think one that is a better track for efficiency is the average cost per student. Um, uh, cost per square foot can be misleading. Cost per student is a little bit more accurate. So um, our average has been $12,300 across our projects. So we measure it on our own projects. It's hard for us to measure it against PDE because they don't provide that information. Um, the next one, average e &O, errors and emissions, at, uh, half a percent um, of the work we do, we average uh, less than a half percent on error and emissions on projects. Um, and then uh, the last one on this slide is uh, our project bids. Um, we are in within three and a half percent of our cost estimates, and most of the time we are within two percent. With identifying how to make the best decision, picking the right option, there's some things that we like to go through in the process. One of them is to help you define your goals. As Chris had mentioned, with the cost per student as opposed to cost per square foot, we really look at those numbers and compare those because cost per square foot, you may be overbuilding, but it may be a good cost per square foot. We really look at what are your student needs, what's your curriculum, uh, how are you teaching? Are you using project-based learning? Are you doing maker spaces? Well, how does that impact the over squ overall square footage? And so we look at that compared to each student as opposed to just general square footage to the building. Some of the other things that we help you define in the goals are how are you meeting your public needs? Are you communicating well with the public, with your staff, with your students? Are they getting input in this and defining what their goals are as well? And then we take all that information, help put a matrix together to list your priorities. Obviously, budget is one of those, but we also look at demographics, 21st century learning in your curriculum, and how those all incorporate kind of ranking, <coughs> what your priorities are to make sure that you're getting the right building for your needs. Um, and then we also, we move forward and look more things like those curriculum driven things, not the bricks and sticks of the building, but how do you teach? How do you teach your students? How does your staff use the building? Those aren't really the mortar and the actual structure of the building, but how does that drive what the building looks like? Some of the other pieces that we look at are the actual building pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, working the budget with the, uh, you know, sort of maximizing the potential of the building, the program, and what you're trying to achieve, that's a critical step. And as Aaron uh, mentioned, you know, finding out your priorities and uh, understanding your, your goals, along with just good architectural goals of, you know, daylighting sustainability, uh, is a, a critical thing to discover with you. And I think we really view it as a discovery process to learn about you, what you're looking for, learn about your community, 
and to really get to know you well and what your aspirations are and to turn that into the building and something that you really feel is personalized and represents you well. And that's, I think, one of the most critical things that we do, maybe differently than some other firms, is just that. We try to create a product that in the end really speaks to you and your goals. And I hope you noticed as we were showing the, the pictures through there that our, the variety of our work, I think, really demonstrates that. It's uh, that we take a very unique approach to each one. I think the uh, technology integration, daylighting, sustainability, all those things, really, we, we discuss that with you and find out what your aspirations are, what level you want to take those things to. Some of the things we just do is part of what we always do. I mean, daylighting is always a consideration. We all know the benefits of daylighting to performance, and so you really have to consider that. And one of the ways we go about achieving that are focus groups. And that can be done in a, a number of different ways. Uh, sometimes we'll be in a, a group format in person like this, other times through surveys. But we really try to gather information from everyone involved, every stakeholder, every interest, uh, interest group that uh, you know, has a say or wants to have a say in this. We really want it to be, once again, represent the whole community. And um, the focus groups are a method of getting to that. The, uh, the public meetings, once again, we're available. We are, can do it at whatever times are convenient and whatever really uh, allows that kind of input as much as possible. One of the questions was regarding PlanCon in the process and how do we understand that. We have a good working relationship specifically with Jim Vogel. We've also worked with Mr. Rivera, who is now the Secretary of Education for the state on um, previous projects. We's, we have actually worked with him. So we, ha we do have a direct connection um, and, and, and it has worked well with us. We all know that there's a moratorium right now. We're going through the process of what's coming, what's the process going to look like. We know the old plan con process, but what does that mean under the new regime? And, and if there is money, what's happening? How do we get it? Uh, how do we move forward? And it looks like there may be some changes going on. Uh, there's, a, there's a committee getting together, discussing those, those changes, and how do we streamline the process? But as of today, we just got notification the mor moratorium is still on. So, so that's part of what we're trying to navigate and understand your needs as well uh, as understand what's coming from the state. Um, Act 34, no matter what, applies. That's a, a school code. So, so no matter what, even if PlanCon doesn't move forward or we don't see anything happening with the moratorium, you still have to go through that Act 34 hearing. Uh, just so that the public is aware of the money spent, what the building looks like, what you're providing for your students. Okay, as we uh, bring this to a close, we just want to leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, why us? We're going to start out with we listen. We want to understand what you want. It's your project. It's your school district. We're here to figure out what your goals and needs are and give it to you as efficiently as we can. You have two minutes. Right on time. Okay. Um, the second part of that we've hit a number of times, it's a tailored approach. We're not bringing a project out of the drawer that we just, the last project we did or the last school district we worked for. We follow up of uh, listening to you, knowing your programs, knowing how you're, you teach and give you a personalized tailored project that meets your requirements. I want to follow up with attention to detail. We um, get the big ideas, but we follow them through to the small ideas and how they work in your buildings. Um, an example, part of that is, you know, we're responsible to give you uh, a solid set of drawings, cost estimate that reflects what's going out in the community. We will enlist a contractor that has experience in school work to review our drawings and our cost estimates at milestones along the way. So it's not just us working on previous history, it's what's actually going on out in the world at this time. And then we want to lead you with um, the team that we have here, the people that we have at this interview, are the people that you see the whole way through. Um, it will be led by the partner, but you're going to see this team the whole way through. We aren't the marketing people. We're the people that do the work and the people that talk to you at the same time. 
We want to thank you for having us here tonight, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we will have EI Associates. Seat. It's only one, so I won't have to go through there. It's two of you, two of you can sit. Mm -hmm. I think you guys had enough people talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is our last group tonight, and uh, this is Kurt Sanders, so uh, he'll do his presentation. Evening, everybody. Hopefully, last but not least. Uh, so, I'm here uh, tonight talking from EI Associates in Harrisburg, um, and I know we have a short timetable, so I'll get right to it. So, a little bit about what I want to cover tonight. Uh, a little bit about our firm, uh, talk a little bit about some of our similar experiences uh, in high school projects, um, a little bit about our design philosophy, and ultimately the reason why we're all here, why choose EI Associates. So we have two offices at EI. We have one in Harrisburg, one in New Jersey. Uh, between the two of them, over 80, 80 total employees, 19 architects, 12 engineers, and 11 lead professionals. Uh, I like to mention lead separately because that's something that we take very seriously at EI. Uh, we've been embracing LEAD for a very, very long time. Uh, proximity and familiar, familiarity, uh, obviously we've done work with Dover in the past. Uh, I think our location does give us uh, a great advantage if there are any hiccups, so to speak, in any construction project. We can make short-term reaction decisions. Uh, and experience. Um, our firm is education architecture. Um, it's more rare that we have a non-education project in our office than we don't. Um, I'd say 95% of our work any given year is education related. It's something we take very seriously um, and the people we bring on board are passionate for it. So overall we've done really over 400 different individual educational projects over the years. This is very tough to read. <laughs> so this is our proposed design team for this project. Obviously at the top is the school district and what I mean by the school district in this slide is the whole community. Uh, I, think, I think schools are an interesting animal because there's so many different stakeholders in a school, whether it be the community, former alumni, current students, or future alumni. You know, I graduated from Southwestern, and I can tell you every time I drive by, I certainly care what's going on there. And I think that's the, that's the fun thing about a school. Everybody cares about where they went to school. Uh, so in this slide, we have illustrated our, our engineer partners. So in this one, we have... You know, for the purposes of this Gatterin deal and Baker and Ingram, we've worked very successfully with them very recently on a lot of different projects. Uh, but that being said, everybody has relationships that they're comfortable with. So if you guys have somebody you want to bring to the table, there's nobody that we can't work with. Uh, so for our team, as far as EI, Mark Barnhart, for those of you who have been around long enough, Mark is our principal, uh, been with the firm for over 20 years. Um, pretty much anything that goes in or around a project, Mark has his hands in. Myself, I think I have the coolest role in the company. I get to work with all of you guys, and I get to really be the, you know, the liaison between the, the customer and, and the architects, and I think that's, that's probably the coolest job there is. Dan Brzezanski um, handles our uh, construction administration. Again, been with the firm for over 20 years. And Long, uh, anything that has to do with architecture he handles. So she works with studies, lead, um, design. She's been with the firm since 1985 and Roger, uh, new to the firm, but been in the field for over 30 years. So we, we definitely bring a lot of experience, um, not only in the community, but in, in this field as well to the table. A quick slide about all the things that we can do out of our Harrisburg office. So basically anything from architecture, from design down to grant writing. And we like to make sure we highlight grant writing because that's, that's very important lately. You know, it's, it's helped a lot of districts get into projects and make the projects better um, by being able to apply for certain grants, whether it be the ACE grant or you know, things along that line to help projects move along. You know, one of the projects I'll talk about in a little bit, Halifax was able to secure $1.5 million um, and on a $22 million budget, that goes a long way. So here's our, I call this the design philosophy, you know, team approach. 
Um, at the very top is, are all the stakeholders I mentioned earlier. So you have the community, you have the school board administrators, faculty, students. All of those people have great ideas. And I don't think it's going to be the architect all the time that says, hey, we should do this. It comes from small group sessions and, you know, whether you want to call them charrettes or roundtables, you know, getting together all of the people on this list to come up with what, what the school can be. And I think, that's, I think that's the whole thing. What can it be? And uh, I, I think that's the fun thing, too, seeing what, how the whole process evolves. So quality control. Uh, one of the things that we had been requested to supply is you know, some of our more recent projects. Um, these are our, our recent high school projects. Um, so we went back a couple years. Lately, a lot of the projects we have on our table are new elementary schools. Um, just a, a luck of the draw. There's a lot more elementary schools out there than there are high schools, and it just seems to be cyclical with our clients. So we have a lot of elementary projects going on right now. Ben Salem and Halifax are two of the more recent high school ones. Uh, ben Salem is rather large, over 500,000 square feet, but again, that's a, more additions and alterations than, than actual new construction. But those are some, some statistics for you guys. So I'm going to walk you through two of our uh, more recent projects just to you know, show a little bit about you know, our design philosophy. So here's Ben Salem, and again, this is over 500,000 square feet of additions and alterations. Uh, here's an exterior rendering, classroom, business commons, and this is actually all attached to uh, a kind of a world-class media center, and it's, it's more than just a media center for the students. It's a great hub for the, the entire community to come and use. Tech Ed Room. And Ben Salem actually is, is one of the you know, more recent uh, districts to actually embrace the academy approach. So what I wanted to do is, is enclose a couple of the floor plans that Ben Salem decided to use to incorporate the academy approach. And, and in, the, in the packet that I left in the, the boardroom for you guys, all the floor plans are in there. So just kind of breaking out how they constructed the academies within the school. So Halifax, again, it's, it's a smaller project, $22 million. Um, mostly alterations again but to walk through the school you wouldn't know it uh, we took a tour the other day and we actually have the ribbon cutting this weekend um, and it, it looks like a brand new school so here's a rendering of the outside and then there's where it looks like today actually last week not today that's a lie uh, so last week uh, the media center and again this is this room is so cool uh, so on the picked side not pictured is actually a lot of daylighting a lot of natural windows um, and again, this is a hub. The intention for this is to be a hub for the whole community. So this can be blocked off. There's ac they're actually looking at a kind of a Netflix, uh, not Netflix, a Redbox style library system where, where anybody in the community can come and use this as a branch of the Dolphin County Library. So it's a, it's a pretty cool room. And they actually have a, a media cafe attached to it. So again, used for the community. Could also even be used for small group instruction. Um, this is actually still under construction, so there's no, uh, there's no picture of this room. So secure entrance. Um, like every other school going on right now, here's the secure vestibule. On the right side, you see to, in, to enter the high school, and the left side is actually the district administration. So the auditorium lobby. Uh, and again, the small workspace commons, which you know, when we walked through the school, they were actually using these already, and it, it's so cool to see the teachers out there interacting with students in, in a smaller group atmosphere. Um, you could just tell they were far more engaged, and it, it, it turned out really, really nice. <coughs> One of the classrooms. The music room was was by far one of my favorite rooms. That when you walked in, you just felt like it was you wanted to learn. It was it was awesome. Science room. So pictured here are all of our lead awarded projects. Uh, so the ones in red are are currently awarded. The ones in black uh, have been submitted. Wilson uh, in, in Carlisle Area School District was just awarded a platinum uh, last week. So it's our third platinum uh, design building and, and something we're very proud of. And I know, you know John Friend's very proud of it too. So really, why are we here? You've sat through five presentations now. You know, why, why move forward with a company like EI Associates? And you know, what I have on this sheet here, I call it ingredients to a successful project. This is all something you should also see in a well-constructed feasibility study. You know, looking at where you currently are with both your, when your enrollment, your your facility is not only in condition but in capacity and where you want to be. And, and here, all those ingredients come together to work with options. And when you get to options, that's when the collaboration really starts. You know, it's not an architect sitting in a room saying, this is what you should do. 
and, and that's just that'll never work out to be a great project. It's coming up with different options together, piecing together everything and coming up with one project as a group. And I think those are the best projects that have the best turnout. And obviously cost estimates and state reimbursement, so through the plan con process, which if I remember correctly, you've already submitted plan con A, so you should be in line for that, that funding. So really a few bullet points on why partner with us. Um, we have experience in the district with Lieb Elementary and North Salem Elementary. Um, our focus on education, uh, and again, the people that we bring on board at EI have a passion for it. And, and you, you look around the office and they're, they're not talking about buildings, they're talking about how to design buildings to make students learn better. And I think that is one of the coolest things available. And at the bottom, the, the last one is, I think to me, the most important is service. You know, you, you listen to, to four other architects before me, and, and I'm sure we have a very similar story. And I think, you know, for me in my personal life, I do business with companies that give me the best service and are there for me when I, when I need them. And I don't see this as any, any different type of transaction. And I think at EI, we pride ourselves on giving that world-class service when things go great and when things go wrong. And I think that's, to me, that's, that's my job, and that's the part of the reason why I love working here. So that's all I have. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on in the agenda then. Um, thank you very much. We have our first public comment period. This is a three minute period for items on or off tonight's agenda. Uh, if you have anything you would like to state, please come to the microphones and state your name and address for the record. Nobody's moving, so we'll move on. Uh, board's president, board president's communication. We did have an executive session uh, this past Tuesday, September 20th, immediately following our board meeting to discuss a personnel matter. I do not have anything else under other communication items uh, for tonight, so we'll get into our committee reports at this time. Our first committee up would be comprehensive planning with Mrs. Maley. Okay, so um, at, at the end of last year, we established uh, three goals um, for our three-year plan. Um, the, the goals are uh, in place to help keep the district um, on target. Um, and all, implement, all implementation steps for the 2016-17 school year have been started. I'm just going to go over, um, read each goal, and then just kind of read a highlight from each one um, since we're already at 830. <laughs> Um, goal number one was establish a district system that fully ensures a consistent implementation of effective instructional practices across all classrooms in each school. Um, just a, a highlight from that one, um, differentiated supervision plans have been rolled out for all teachers and they were, um, these were all teacher created to allow more flexibility and ownership in professional development. Um, Goal number two, establish a district system that fully ensures consistent implementation of standards aligned curricula across all schools for all students. Um, one of the, um, the good things that have come out of that is that uh, Mr. Cherry has already uh, talked to department chairs at PDE um, in the social studies and science departments and um, they're planning on coming out to work with us on curriculum. Did you want to say anything more about that? No, I just had the opportunity to attend a state meeting uh, last week. So while I was there, there were two ad hoc committees, and they just happened to be the state representatives for social studies and science. So uh, I went up to them afterwards just to get their contact information, and um, both of them agreed. They said, don't, sh don't send me an email. Just tell us when you want us to come, and we'll come down. We'll bring the team. We'll review your curriculum, what's going on. We'll do classroom visits, and uh, we'll work with your district. So. Uh, we're back and forth right now trying to establish some dates and times for their teams to come visit us. Okay, great. Um, goal number three, establish a, a district system that fully ensures each member of the district community that, I'm sorry, that fully ensures each member of the district community promotes, enhances, and sustains a shared vision of positive school climate and ensures family and community support of student participation in the learning process. Um, and one of the highlights from that goal is that over the summer, the elementary intervention specialists 
um, met to create a handbook for all staff members um, with consistent positive behavior intervention and support strategies, um, which is, is certainly good to have in our district. Um, and one, one of the things that came out of our meeting tonight was that Mr. Cobb, I believe he left already, but Mr. Cobb will be providing a copy of the um, training on Danielson's framework for teaching for all the board members. Um, he showed it to me briefly and I thought it might be something um, that the board members might appreciate uh, looking at and maybe possibly uh, the community. But um, I had asked if he would take care of that and he said he would. And um, that's all I have. Any questions for Mrs. Maley? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to curriculum and professional development with Mr. DeLauder and Mrs. Herman. Okay, um, we met this evening here in, in the uh, room. Uh, we actually had a large uh, crowd of, of, of staff here, um, which I appreciate very much so, and I would hope that that would continue. Uh, in the future. Time's up, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Sorry>. Next. <laughs> Talk about bread. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, so we start off the the, uh, the meeting with uh, going over the results of a professional development survey that was sent to the staff after the week of, of professional development at the beginning of the school year. Uh, the survey was sent to 200, 253 of professional staff members, and out of those 253, we received 147 responses, which uh, resulted basically uh, adds up to 58% participation, which I think was is, is phenomenal uh, from our staff. So again, I, I, I thank them for for um, for partaking of that. And our survey consists of five questions. Uh, we want to know was the uh, staff development of high quality? Was it timely? Uh, were they able to gain new information skills? Uh, did they provide important resources and did it help pre prepare them for the school year? Um, <clears throat> we basically found that 76 felt that the, it was of high quality. 74 rated it as timely. 99, 99 participants gained new information. 90 gained important resources, and 60 believed that the professional development prepared them for the school year. And the four questions, um, the, the second question uh, was, as far as did the delivery of professional development, and out of those four, uh, we looked at whole, whole group, web-based, small group, and self-selected. And then the final questions consisted of the 11 upcoming early dismissal or full day personal, I'm sorry, professional development days on our approved calendar year. Uh, we found that clerical day had the most suggestions for use. Uh, professional learning community as the second highest and vertical planning received the lowest out of those. So from the survey, uh, we concluded that the opening professional development was successful for the majority of our, our staff. Uh, most of those of the staff preferred delivery of professional development in small groups or self-selected. And our professional staff is requesting early, early release days for clerical or professional learning community times throughout the year. Um, and leading into that, uh, if you look on the board, uh, we asked the, the staff that was present to take a look at three of our early dismissal days and to, and to kind of give an idea of where they would like our professional development to go uh, this year. So these are some of the, the ideas there. Uh, so we're going to go back uh, as the administration and as a committee, look at that and try and come up with a plan to help our professional staff um, utilize their, their professional development and to try and get uh, the most out of that. Uh, along with that, uh, while they were doing this as well, we asked them to take a look at our report card uh, comments uh, that are going to be uh, as part of the Skyward program. And we asked them, we had uh, several that are kind of prearranged comments. And so we asked uh, them to kind of come up with an idea of what they would want on the prearranged comments. And uh, at the same time, we also discussed uh, how, what we wanted the free comments to look like. Um, and it was a consensus that we really just wanted that to be up to the teachers um, to uh, be able to put whatever they wanted as far as personal information, or not should I say personal information, but, but um, 
yeah, lost my word that I want to look for. Student-specific. Thank you. Student-specific uh, information uh, on those, uh, on those uh, comment sections. And then lastly, uh, we started getting into um, our progress reports, our mid-quarter mid progress reports, uh, how they're to look, what information is, is to be included on those. Unfortunately, uh, we ran out of time on that. Uh, one thing I did find, uh, I did take away from that, that brief conversation we had, I think we as a district, as a committee, uh, have a lot, to, a lot of work to do um, to get the teachers where they need to be. There seems to be a lot of confusion uh, from the staff on what can be put on those reports, what can't be put on those progress reports. Um, so we're kind of in a time crunch with this as I believe October 25th, 24, somewhere around that time frame. Um, actually, no, I think it's this week. This they need to come out. Friday, reports. they need to come out for, for progress reports. We put uh, them off next week. So, um, so we, we have to, I think, come up with an idea of of how of helping our teachers understand what they need to put on or what they can what they can't um, so that'll be coming up at our next meeting and I'm not sure how we're going to handle that um, in the interim with the teachers but we need to make sure that that they do have the tools necessary and they have a, a good understanding of what we need uh, of what they can and can't do Kathy anything else that you want to add to that you did a great job thank you come on I'm not that good <laughs> <laughs> okay um, that's all I have at this point Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. DeLauder or Mrs. Herman? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to facilities. This would be Mr. Emig, Mr. Rawhauser, and Mrs. Brenton. Oh, all right. We had met tonight, and uh, some of the items that we had gone over, first of all, was the D10 list. We, uh, everything has been completed, but the blinds for the different buildings need to be accomplished. Uh, Tuesday night, an a, uh, item came up about the JV ball field up at the intermediate school. Uh, it is decided that it needs regraded, it needs evaluated. However, if it is the decision that a new building be put up there, that ball field would be removed. But that is uh, something that has to be discussed. So. Um, also, some of the renovations that need to be done at the intermediate school would be air conditioning, such as in the auditorium, an elevator, electrical work, add classrooms, you need locker rooms for the pool, kitchen, cafeteria, and speaking of the pool, both ends would need to be deeper. There would be need to have spectator seating, and two more lanes should be added to that pool. Uh, under the high school, possible expansion would be the main office, air conditioning the gym, uh, cafeteria, and if a new building would take place, we could occupy 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in the uh, existing high school. However, the architect, whoever the firm would be, could give us estimates on proposals for either renovations or buildings, and if you heard them tonight, Neither one of those firms said anything about renovations. All they talked about was a new building. Um, the marquee at this point, we still need more funding. And um, as specified on Tuesday, if anybody's interested in the capital projects, there is a link on our webpage for capital projects. You can go in there and you can see what is all being talked about. And I did ask the question, how could we communicate better to the public and uh, the community courier, the merchandiser, the banner from Dillsburg, uh, plus we would need to know what it would cost to send out newsletters on this. So those are some of the topics that we had talked. Mrs. Britton or Mr. Rawhauser, anything to add? The only thing that we didn't talk about it, but was pointed out to me, and I don't look at it that close, they said the eagle that we have up should look redder. It looks too much like central in the coloring. It's fading. There's a reason for that. Well, I'm just yeah. pointed out. Yeah, you know, was what was that was done as a memorial. For, for yeah, yes. that was a, yeah. The students painted it as a memorial for Matty Hill. Any questions for Mr. Emig or the committee? Mr. I do. Mr. Emig. Um, I have some questions. First of all, uh, what is Act 34? They talked about that in 
Act 34 is the public hearing that you have uh, have to have whenever you're doing a building project. Um, it, you have to go through the specifics of the design of the building. You have to go through the cost. You know what, what's it going to cost the taxpayers. All of that information needs to be shared there as in one presentation to the public, and that meeting has to be only for that um, purpose. So that would probably be you know a bigger arena than this. So. Um, you know, that's once once the district or once the board has decided what we want in our buildings and things like that, and we can come to a to a good cost and everything. So that is what the and then we present that to the to the community. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yes, okay. that that's a, it has to be a public hearing, and um, the community can come out and voice their concerns and, and everything like that. So. Um, I mean, I think it's a good thing, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's mandated um, through the school code. Okay, okay, and a couple of times L E E D came up. What's that? Oh, it's a certification. Is that Dave? Uh, certif okay. yeah. I'm gonna get, uh, let Dave talk about that one. <clears throat> Lead certification. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Lead certification is. Uh, basically, it's the energy efficiency and the reuse of recyclable materials in building your building. So if you start out with a, uh, and I, I can't remember, if it's silver, gold, platinum, each one of them is a little bit more energy efficient, uses a little more recycled materials. Uh, it qualifies you for more reimbursement from the state. Uh, obviously, if it's more energy efficient, you gain because you're not spending as much on energy. Uh, they do things like uh, shelving would not be wood, it would be wheat board made out of wheat. Oh. Stuff like that. They would use recycled plastic, they would use carpet that was recycled, they would use uh, right down to things like caulking and windows would have to meet certain VOC, volatile organic compound thresholds. Um, that it couldn't be high in VOCs. The paint would have to be a special paint, low in VOCs. It would ha everything is done to make a, I'm gonna use the word pristine environment. Um, it's the most environmentally, ecologically friendly building you can build if you go with a platinum building. It is also the hardest to get. So it's not like a, we're gonna build a platinum building. Okay, you can start there, but you're evaluated once you get done, whether or not you did in fact make lead silver, lead gold, or lead platinum. It's not an automatic. You can shoot for that, but you may not make it. Dependent, it just depends on a lot of factors. Uh, I, I remember years ago when Hanover School District built a new building out off of Clearview Road. And they did the geothermal wells, they did wheat board for their shelving in, their, in, their, uh, in the classrooms and in the library. Um, they did everything they thought they should do, and the contractor substituted caulking in the windows, and it cost them lead platinum because he didn't use the correct caulking. So they went in and thought, well, we'll just take it all out and put it back in. They still didn't make it because it was still a res residual there of it. So it's little things like that, but it's, it, does that kind of answer? I mean, yes. it's a lot more involved than that, but that's kind of a, a, a brief overview. Well, then do we, is, are we trying to look for a firm that uses, that goes for the sale? Okay. okay, well, Mr. Peters, sorry. <laughs> there, there's, there's, lead is a double-edged sword. Yes, you will get more money back from the state if you qualify for the higher lead buildings, but it's more expensive to build a lead building to start with. So, obviously, if I'm gonna use uh, pine shelving, it's cheap. If I use oak, it's more expensive. If I use wheat board, it's even more expensive. Okay, so everything, it has a price. Um, some of your recycled materials, even though it's great for the environment, is very expensive. Um, uh, they use like recycled quartz for the countertops, they, which is glass and stones ground up and, and smoothed out. Um, that's kind of what it is, but, it, but it, it's sort of, it, it really has to be a decision. You know, you have to kind of decide, do we want to go for a lead and what level do we want to go to? What level do we want to try to get to? Does that make sense? Yeah, but then if we go for that and they screw it up by putting caulking in the well, window, then, then we lose all that, correct? Well, but we that's, spent the that's money. That's why you have to, it really has to be managed. It, it really has to be managed. 
Okay. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> I think I need you again. I'm not going anywhere. So, <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I hope that answer. <laughs> no, well, it does. Kinda, I had no idea what it was. Yeah. Now I at least get, get that. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's a lot of little things, but yet it's a lot of big things. I mean, when you build a school, you already have to use steel that only comes from the United States. You can't use Chinese steel or Russia steel or something that comes overseas that has to come from the so United States. So we didn't States. do any of that for the buildings we just... We did not do any lead building <coughs> in Wagglestown or here. Is, is that for a renovated and a new building? It's harder to get yeah. lead on a renovated building okay. because you're dealing with old structures and you're not going to get it. Okay. Because the only way you could get lead would be you'd have to tear everything off the walls because of the paint that's on there and because of the whatever. <coughs> And I don't want to say this real loud, but you know, without testing it, that we have things that we shouldn't have on the walls in intermediate school. And I'll guarantee you we do, because if I pull a, black, a blackboard or an old blackboard off the wall, I can, I'd almost guarantee you that the caulking that they use to glue it fast is asbestos. That's almost a given, so. Okay, and then um, Dave, could you, um Okay, only, I only heard grant opportunities, I think, from two of the different um, companies that were with us tonight. Do they all try to do grant, or, I mean, is this just like a given, or is this something we have to say no, to you? No, they Are don't. you going to get those grants? They won't all go after them. Some of them don't have the, I don't think, I shouldn't say this because I don't know, I don't think some of them have the capabilities to do the grants. I don't want to say they don't. I don't know that. I don't want to say, don't, don't quote me and say, well, they don't have the, the ability because they didn't say it, because I don't know that. Uh, but not all of them may do that. And it, it sounds like it's a good deal because you get a lot of money is. back, or is it a pain like the platinum no. thing? No, okay. it's, a, it's generally the architect takes care of the application and the submittal, and we sort of just wait for the, the grant to come in. And a grant is something you don't have to repay. It's not like a loan. You get, if you get $2 million, that's your $2 million. As long as you spend it on your school, you don't have to pay it back. Um, there's some companies out there, I, and I, I know I, I caught one or two of them tonight. I don't know how many, because I didn't see all the presentations because I was running around. But I, I know that some of them said they've gotten grant, you know, received mm -hmm. grants and that sort of thing. So I know there's grants out there. Um, it's kind of like anything else. You, you, it's, it's and Mrs. Herman, I know the grants that they spoke of, they're, I think they're $2 million grants and you can use them as soon as you get them. Yes. So they can be utilized during the project. Right. You don't have to wait till the project's over. Once you, you submit for them, the money. you right. apply for them, you submit for them, you're approved, you get the money, you use it right away. So you don't have to wait till the project's over and use it to pay off. So Whatever. that comes to us. That grant comes directly to the yes. school district, not has not nothing to, the to do with those no. other people. No. Okay. All right. And the other thing that's really a thorn in my head is um, change orders. Okay. Now, there were two companies that did not mention their percentage of change orders, which I'm taking as a grain of salt anyway, because I figure they can put up there anything they want. Was that a change order on one building, or is that a change order their average, or what? So, what I'd like to know, Dave. Um, I know we had Crabtree do some work for us. Mm -hmm. Can you figure out how much? I we know had? how much. Okay, give me. <laughs> okay, uh, Wagglestown project. We ran into some things that we weren't ready for, uh, and we spent 0.8 percent in change orders. Did you say that again? How much? 0.8 percent. Oh, just 0.8. Okay, all right. That was just at Wagglestown. Yep. And okay. at Dover Elementary, it was 0.65. And they were both renovations. All right. Now, Crabtree said, I'm oh, sorry, I'm taking all this time, but Crabtree said that they guarantee that they will meet the budget. Now, that budget doesn't include change orders, though, correct? Yes, like, it does. It does. Oh, wait, how many? They're only allowed. No, they're guaranteeing you. That they're, what they're saying is if we tell you it's going to cost you, I don't know. Thirty million. Forty-eight million. Okay. Let's 48. throw a number out here. Okay. If, if if they tell you it's going to cost you forty-eight million, that's what it's going to cost you at the end. If you have a change order that goes over, they will cover it. Um, we had a big change order here at Dover Elementary, um, and it happened literally two days before school opened. Nobody even thought about, it, but the, we had a bus loop out front. Brought the first bus in, it wouldn't go around. Mm -hmm. You probably remember that now that I'm saying it. 
you had to back the bus up to get around the corner because somebody didn't figure that the bus was 60 feet long and couldn't make the radius. So literally in two days, we moved the curb and blacktopped it in two days. Crabtree covered 100% of that cost and the owner, now not, not uh, <coughs> Mr. Rarball wasn't doing, Tom Crabtree is the other half of it. He came out and supervised the whole thing start to finish. And, and any change order that came along, it was taken care of? Yes. Okay. We had change orders, but they were under our, I'm sorry, they were under that umbrella of this is how much it's gonna cost you. So if they, if, they come in, if they come in less than what their quote is, that's what you pay, and any change order falls underneath that. Okay, now I didn't notice anybody else saying that. They were the only firm that I heard that, that they guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So that's something we could go back and ask all of them again. One of the things that Jen and I talked about was when we, we, we did this rubric to figure out the five firms, we basically graded everybody and we spent a lot of time doing it to the point where it was like, oh my gosh, do we have to look at another one? So, uh, but anyway, one of the things that we talked about was, you, and I'm sure you heard it tonight from every firm, and again, again I wasn't in the room to hear all of them, but that um, we come in under budget every time, you know, or we come in under budget, what we tell you is going to be, we're under, okay. There's two ways to look at that. Did they price it that high? that they're gonna come under budget? That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Or did they price it right on and they came in on budget? So you, there's a lot of ways to look at that. Or, they, or are they just that good? So it's just something to, you know, our perception is it's just something to think about. Um, and there were, you know, some firms I think you saw in the presentation where they priced it really low and they came in over. way over budget. Right. So, you know, which would you, ra which would you rather and again, it's, it's, it's your decision, but which would you rather have? Okay, it's going to cost me this much. I know I'm going to be under that, but you may, you're may you going to end up paying that, okay? Or do, do they price it low and I come in slightly over it because they priced it close and ran into something they didn't, they didn't understand? So change orders are, and I think anybody will tell you this, an existing building to renovate, remodel, whatever, add on to, it's very difficult to say it's gonna cost this much because I tear that wall down, I don't know what's in back of it. I don't know what the foundation looks like. I don't know what the structure looks like if, if I've never seen it. And a lot of it you can't see till you tear down and that's where a lot of your change orders come through when you're doing a renovation. Your, reno your change orders on new construction should be very low because they're dealing with set parameters they know what they're they know what they're what they're putting in if there's a mistake somebody screwed up on the architecture or engineering side the only thing you run into with with any building and i don't care if you're doing a, a new construction or you're doing a remodel or a renovation or an addition however you want to look at that is you don't know what you're going to hit when you dig so if you hit rock it's going to cost you if you find something you didn't know that was down there, like uh, artesian well, it's going to cost you. So what you need to do when you do that is you need to put an alternate in the bid to cover that. So you, when you bid it out, you can say for your, uh, because you bid everything sort of, they bid everything sort of separately, not us. Uh, when we go out to bid, they're going to bid for an MEP, they're going to bid for an electrical contractor, um, um, they're going to bid for, uh, um, gosh, structural, um, a general contractor. So, uh, and a uh, landscape architect, landscaper, or a, I'm, not, I'm not using the right term, guy that digs a hole. <laughs> I'm getting tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm struggling here. <laughs> okay, so you bid, when you bid that, you say, okay, we want an alternate price if you hit rock. So if they hit rock, they don't come back and say, well, it's gonna take us a jackhammer and five days to get through it. You don't, you don't end up with that. So you wanna make sure you cover yourself with things like, even on a remodel, if, you're gonna, if we're gonna do a remodel or a renovation or an addition, cover it with, with rock. Because I'll guarantee you, I ran into it already, at, at the intermediate school, on the side towards Intermediate Avenue is sitting on rock, six inches below the ground. It's solid. 
It's not down there a foot, it's down six inches. As we tried to core drill with a 24 inch core drill to put those portables in and we had a jackhammer, 24 inch holes, 96 of them. So something to think about when we go into this construction. I'll help you, I can, Thank you. I've done it before so. <laughs> I kind of know what to look for. I'm not saying I won't make a mistake, but I kind of know what to look for. Well, I but. noticed some of them, they put right on the spot, and some they're moving all, you know, all different. And I'm like, okay, what's under there? Dover has tons of rocks down yes. there. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, I, and I point out, I mean, hey, and I, I don't know, are we going to build at the intermediate school site or are we going to renovate the intermediate school site? But if we're going to renovate or we're going to build, we just have to be cognizant of the fact that we do not want to go towards Intermediate Avenue because I know that's, that's bedrock. <clears throat> we put a sewer line in. I had to put a re replace the sewer line from the building out to uh, uh, Intermediate Avenue, and we dug through eight feet of rock the whole way. We went down eight feet. Okay, let me ask you one more thing that came up in my mind while you were talking. So when you when you get your architect then and you tell them what you want, then they go out and get all the other like the electrician they go out and they get the builder like we don't or do the, we have to go with their builder no the architect what the architect will do is they'll give us a rough diagram basically what you saw up here on the board tonight some of them showed like floor plans if you will they will take those floor plans once they're approved by all the shareholders they will take those floor plans and they will have a structural engineer and your electrical engineer and your mechanical and plumbing engineer and all the engineers will get together and they'll come up with the plans. They'll come up with the building specifications and those building specifications will then, by us and by the architect, will be sent out as a bid proposal. Uh, okay. And they will come back in usually as four prime contracts. So you're gonna look at a general contractor uh, you, I, I keep saying MEP, but it's actually an HVAC contract. Somebody does your heating, ventilation, air conditioning, an electrical, um, and, a, and usually a landscape. Somebody that does your grounds and your earth moving and that kind of stuff. Uh, so you'll end up with four contracts coming back in that'll have to be, and, and it might be, you might have six or eight companies bid on all, all any, you know, six general contractors and six electrical contractors and, you know, and, and, we are bound by low bid. So it doesn't matter if Bob's Electric does the best work in the world and John's Electric does the worst work in the world. If John comes in low, you have to take him. You have no choice. You have no choice. If I have a question, a follow-up sure. question on the um, change orders. Um, if a company guarantees a, a quote or guarantees their estimate, um, and you run into change orders. Who determines whether a change order is implemented and how it's implemented? Is that up to the architectural firm to decide that, or is that up to the, you know, you in this case? That's gen well, generally it's up to the school board. Now, in both the Wigglestown project, the stadium project, and, and this project over elementary, they, the board, I shouldn't say they, I'm sorry, the board said, superintendent, up to $5,000 on a change order, you can go ahead and approve. Anything over $5,000, we want to know about it prior to it going out. Anything over $5,000 has to come to the board for their approval. So that's sort of how we did it. And the, and the only reason you would want to do that is if you hit something that you didn't anticipate and you got to wait till next month to do it, you're sitting still. So you're not you're not progressing, and and if you're on a if you're on a timeline like, gosh, which one was it? McKissick, I think, had a 12 month timeline to build. That to, that is extre I'll tell you that's extremely aggressive. That is extremely aggressive. 12 month. Um, if you got to wait three weeks for a decision, it's going to push the whole project. It could push the whole project back three weeks. Okay. The other question I had was. Um, one of them, one of the presentations talked about uh, interest-free loans. Um, yes. I was wondering where the source of that would come from. That's, that's the first that I had heard something like that. You know, I wish I could answer that. Con, we know about <laughs> you know, grants, but where would we get interest-free loans from? 
I don't, I don't know who said it, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. That was intriguing. To yeah, me. I don't know that. I can't answer that question. <laughs> Uh, honestly, you get in finances, you need to ask her. <laughs> I, I, I was just curious. If so I, I, I can definitely uh, look into that. Um, it's not something that I have come across, um, but I can look into it. Perk my curiosity, too. <laughs> Anything else? Not for you, but just to echo something that Terry said. Um, I too felt like the presenters um, talked about new construction, not so much renovation. Um, certainly, uh, you know, didn't get that feel from them, um, for the most part. And I just wondered if that was uh, how they were told to construct their presentation, or if that's just what they all kind of went with. I don't know that we really set a new high school. Um, we didn't really specify either or. I think th there was word out there that we were looking at a new high school. Um, I think but, I, my, but, my opinion is they looked at the plan con documents and yeah, figured that's that, where we yeah. were going. Um, but they knew that no decision has been made of new or renovation. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's what I, I talked to every one of them before they left tonight to try and give them a timeline as when, when I thought maybe the board would narrow it down to three and, and didn't give them any guarantees, so if it takes you till December, that's fine. I didn't tell them it was going to be next month or November, but um, I tried to tell them that and 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 told them that we really don't know what we want yet, and it's going to be your decision whether we renovate and add or we build new. It's it's still got to be decided. So I think they all left here knowing that. I pretty much told everybody the same thing when we started and the same thing when we ended. So. Well, I do I believe the last the last representative there that we heard from did mention two different situations that was <coughs> renovated. renovated right. Yeah, so there was a little bit of yeah. that in there. It wasn't all strictly new. Right, well, I'd say had some of that in their presentations. I just felt like the majority of it was not focused that way. It might just be a matter of it's the easiest thing for such a short period of time to present as opposed to you not, not knowing what we specifically want to renovate in the specifics, it's probably more difficult to kind of come up with the present, presentation for that than, you know, here's kind of a new, just, you know, general construction thing. That's kind of what I was thinking. I just thought of something else. Are you familiar with, aside from Crabtree, any of the other companies there work? Uh, only through a little bit. Word of mouth, maybe. Yeah. I, I, the, only, the only architect I ever worked with was Crabtree. Um, EI Associates, they're the ones that constructed North Salem and did the renovations on live back in 91? 98. I'm, I'm drawing, I'm trying to think what it was. 98. Um, and uh, I mean, we're happy with North Salem, so I, I'm happy with North Salem, let me put it that way. Uh, so. So they did the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy with this building in Wagglestown. I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. So as far as the rest of them, I mean, I don't know anything about RPLS uh, or Schrader Group. Um, Messick, nothing. McKissick, no, I don't know. I, those okay. I don't know anything about. So I'm, I'm no help there at all. <laughs> I can only tell you what I, the people that I know, so. Any other questions for the committee? Okay. Next up is Human and Fiscal Resources with Mr. Cook. We met this evening to talk about a number of items on our agenda. Uh, first item on the agenda was the budget status. Uh, Tuesday night we approved the budget timeline for 2017-18. Uh, wait a minute, am I right on that? Wow, it's like hard to First time I've said that, that seems weird. Um, but it's, it's amazing to me that we've just gone through a budget process, just finalized it, and already plans are in place and the ball is rolling on moving ahead. So I just want to share that, that you know, this isn't a January through May adventure. This is a starting immediately and moving ahead. So um, on that budget timeline that we approved the other night, I just for the public and for the board here, just wanted to highlight a couple of things on there. Um, PDE will issue their index. Um, they've done a preliminary index of 2.5%, which would 
basically say that, you know, we're not going to raise taxes beyond that without referendum. That is subject a little bit to change yet, but that's their preliminary number. Um, I mean, I mean, let me jump in there. That is their base index. Their so base we index. definitely know the index will be that. And okay. then they take a look at um, like market value aid ratio, and then you'll get an adjusted index. So last year our adjusted index was 3.3, .3, I believe. Um, so we wouldn't be able to raise taxes above that um, threshold. So I, th I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think the base index was 2.6 last year. Right. So um, gets you an idea of where we were um, last year versus this year. Um, last year's market aid, uh, market <laughs> aid ratio, I apologize, um, was 0 0.6011. And I think this year it's like 0 0.6096. So that's where we okay. stand with that. Thank you. Um, a couple other highlights for the budget timeline. Uh, we had received our first budget target on, by November 15th. Um, we will at that point have to adopt a tax resolution of whether or not we're intending to raise tax or, or, or above the 2.5 or whatever the adjusted amount is uh, or not, um, something we do every year. Uh, principals are weighing in at that time with their, their um, foreseeable you know, expenses, needs, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a, co a community survey that goes out in January that we'll ask for the community to weigh in in the budget process. Um, the budget uh, will be brought to the board then. The preliminary uh, or proposed final budget will be brought to the board in April. Uh, according to the timeline, uh, it will be posted for 20 days at that point, assuming we approve the uh, posting of it and then the final budget would be approved in May. So that's the timeline. We do have an additional 30 days if need be. Uh, it has to be approved by June 30th. So that's that's kind of the timeline. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the basics there. Um, we took a look at the audit status and uh, the auditors have already been in to review the 2015-16 uh, report. Um, they are actually ahead of schedule, so we're in, we're in pretty good shape there. They're waiting on a few things yet to come back from outside sources that, you know, we can't provide yet at this point, but no major issues this far. Things are on track and looking pretty good. Um, refunding status we looked at. Um, we are in the process of, um, as you recall, we had approved some time back, a few months back, uh, the idea of refunding the 2011 A, a bonds, correct? Um, and right now, um, there is a rating process taking place. It's it's perhaps within days of uh, finding our, our rating, and then depending on what that is, we could potentially market that and get a interest savings there on our bonds. So. Um, no guarantees that it will happen, but it's in the process right now, and, and we'll be taking a look at that, Jen's on top of that. So, um, and we also looked at the uncom uh, uncompensated leave policy review. There's actually a number of policies that we have in the district here that talk about uncompensated leave policy. Uh, one of them pertaining to the staff was recently updated. Uh, staff employees was recently updated last year, but um, there are others in place that haven't been updated since 2003. Uh, we're looking into that. We've asked uh, uh, Dave Casino to do some investigation in other districts, how they implement their policies, uh, kind of the in-house approach of how they orchestrate them and, and what kind of policies they have for support staff and administrative staff, that sort of thing. So we'll pick that topic back up next month. Um, so. I believe that's it. Did I miss anything? Okay. Any questions for Mr. Cook? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to safe and supportive schools with Mr. Deschel. Okay, just a couple of things. Um, we were going over what we did last year and we were just trying to figure out if we finished everything. Um, one of the items that we didn't, um, we don't know the status of was the standing order for nurses with the EpiPen. We can't remember if that was actually finalized or not, so. You mean the grant? 
Uh, no, that was, uh, I think it was the grant. <coughs> It's all been submitted. Well, I'll check on that tomorrow okay. and I'll give you an update. So I know it was all submitted and it was it was done. I thought we were awarded that amount, but I'll check on it tomorrow. Okay. Then the other thing was uh, the intruder drill is now officially going to be called the critical response incident response exercise. That is its official new name. Uh, it would be critical response incident response exercise. Right. Didn't come up with it. So uh, the next parent meeting for North Salem for kindergartner parents is on October 6th. So after that, officially K through six has been spoken to by Northern Regional. And our next meeting is on October 27th. That's all I have. Any questions for Mr. Deshaux? Okay, here is what what kind of response we've had from the, the public meetings there's uh, has there been a lot of interest in what's happening there um, I've just personally I was not at the uh, the first through six meeting I could speak to that I, I went to the back to school night I believe it was August 31st at North Salem Elementary and there were two officers from Northern Regional that came to do the presentation um, they did a very fine job of outlining exactly what would be happening how it would be happening uh, that if you wish to keep your child out of school that day that was an option um, so that you know they were not involved in this um, they asked for questions there were none and I didn't see anybody going up to them afterwards to ask questions so I thought it went extremely well and they covered everything they really needed to cover in that anything else okay we'll move on to the superintendent's report mr. cherry uh, I have three items for this evening uh, the first one we met as a uh, small group to kind of kick off the Dover Eagle Foundation so we got right into action and business and we are going to start planning some annual events so we're taking a look at the spring of 2017 and the fall of 2017. So we, um, by a majority and touching noses and pointing, elected Bobby to take care of the spring event and Brad to take care of the fall event. So we're looking for something that we can obviously, as I said before, do on an annual basis and start small and grow. So we're thinking about a golfing tournament in the spring and then taking a look at some type of event in the fall, hopefully with the weather pursue, maybe ski round top, some tubing for the kids, but also like a chili wing, something that we could do there um, that we could start and then grow every year with the proceeds going to the Dover Eagle Foundation so that we could give grants to our teachers and obviously give scholarships to our students because those are the primary things that we do. We also discussed the need for possibly doing some smaller uh, items at uh, home, homecoming events to uh, invigorate our alumni and keep them attached to school. So we talked uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes about our alumni and ways that we can make sure that they stay connected to the district and we think the foundation could be a good starting point for that uh, as well. And then we had our fourth conversation just around educational sponsorships. So we figured aside from the, the fundraising and so forth, we actually wanna do some events here in the district that are sponsored by the foundation and work directly with schools. So we talk a little bit about shadowing opportunities, career opportunities, um, doing some type of diversity, um, cultural events within the district. So that's still in the early uh, planning phases, but we thought that that would be a nice way also for the uh, Dover Eagle Foundation to interact with the schools. Uh, that didn't really pertain to fundraising or money, but you know, obviously, once again, reinforcing that idea that we're here for educational purposes. So uh, we plan to meet monthly during committee evenings and uh, hopefully grow our, our committee over time. So um, that was our, our first update. Uh, my second update could, is... Ken, could I yep. just add one thing on the foundation? Um, because I know we have members of the community here tonight along with the staff, but if you do participate in the United Way campaign yep. uh, here in York County, you can designate the Dover Eagle Foundation as the recipient of your United Way contributions. Um, so we would certainly appreciate that if you do participate in the campaign as those dollars would come back to our students here in the district. And uh, we talked about doing some more uh, media blitz with that tomorrow morning. So uh, that was one of our topics we considered old business. So we'll be readdressing that again and also reminding our own staff that they have until Friday of next week uh, to turn in those United Way forms. Um, second item on the list is uh, 
We are going to pursue uh, hiring a part-time library secretary for the intermediate school and high school for the remainder of the year. We've been searching um, far and wide to find a media specialist for the IS, uh, but the well is a little dry right now, so we're going to wait to see what students graduate in December to see if that will uh, bring about a possibility. But in the meantime, we would like to hire a part-time person. And then uh, what we would do in the budgeting process going into next year is put that position in for board consideration uh, as to whether or not they want to change that from a part-time to a full position next year. So we do have the funds to cover it as a part-time. And then once again, as you know, with every budget cycle, we put options up there for the board con to consider. So we will put this up as a consideration for you to vote on for next year. Um, and then the third item on my list was uh, Mr. Rawhauser brought to our attention a piece of property uh, located, north, uh, lo located next to North Salem that has been used um, by one of our community members uh, pertaining to uh, something that happened back when North Salem was being built. Uh, at that time, uh, I believe a gas line of sorts went across a piece of the property and a, a deal was made with this farmer for uh, their family to utilize the land as kind of, I guess, a payback for the gas line going over, uh, over the property. So uh, Mr. Rawhauser and Jen and I were to go out, but we wanted to see if the owner actually had an agreement because we didn't have an agreement on file here at the time. Um, so we called, we left messages, the owner uh, proceeded to call me back on a Friday. Uh, I'm sorry, we left the message on Friday, she called me back on a Tuesday. Uh, and told me at that time there was no agreement. So um, there obviously wasn't a need to visit her uh, if she didn't have an agreement. So we have contacted our solicitor uh, to come up with some options. So I wanted to put that out there that um, the board might want to consider some options uh, for the use of that land in the future. Any questions for Mr. Cherry? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the miscellaneous category for any other comments or observations from board members. Can I, I want to just um, make an, I think I emailed everybody on the board and anybody out there who is interested on October 6th, I believe, um, is a soccer game, a uh, high school soccer game. Our U10 boys soccer team will be playing a scrimmage against each other under the big lights. Uh, and they're very excited about it. So if anybody is uh, interested in coming out to support the, the boys, uh, the, we are now Dover United, formerly DASA. Um, I know my son is very excited to be with the big kids on the field. So it's something that I think uh, everybody will enjoy. So anybody's welcome to come. Do you know the time of that? I knew you were going to ask me that. I, I can find it. You can send it out. Yeah, I'll send it out. Okay. Yeah, I think it's in the email that I sent around, okay. but um, it's the halftime of the, the varsity game on okay. that Thursday. Right. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? To, uh, we have a uh, two-hour early dismissal tomorrow, so hopefully parents receive phone calls. Did you get phone calls? All right, good. So two-hour uh, early dismissal tomorrow uh, for our staff to have a clerical day. And uh, just to remind everyone that Wednesday, October 5th, uh, we will be having a community pep rally from 7.30 to 8.30 at our high school stadium. So we hope to have the community come out to uh, share in that experience. Okay, anybody else? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to our second public comment period. Again, this is for items on or off of tonight's agenda. This is a two-minute period, and if you have anything you would like to state, please come to the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Okay, nobody is on the move, so I will uh, inform you of our future meetings. October 18th is our board action meeting at 7 o'clock p.m., uh, and then on October 20th, we have our board committee meetings begin at 6 o'clock p.m. and our board planning meeting at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, and there will be a brief um, executive session of the board immediately following this meeting tonight for a personnel matter. If there is nothing else, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you for coming. 6.30. 6.30.